Hello friends. Today, Phil Goley brings our message and I got to listen to it earlier this week and it is powerful. As we continue to move into our time of worship through music, message, and silence, we invite you to breathe deep. Parker Palmer writes, silence is not always golden. There's inattentive silence when we are too self-absorbed to listen to any voice but our own. There is dismissive silence when we hear but don't want to be bothered. There's cowardly silence when we hear cries of suffering, but we pretend we don't for fear of being called to put something on the line. Then there's the receptive silence required to take in all the calls for love, truth, and justice that make rightful claims on our lives. This silence is not inattentive, dismissive, or cowardly. In fact, it may turn out to be brave. When we risk listening deeply and well to the suffering of our brothers and sisters, we may hear something that will require us to change. Come on in. Let's listen deeply and be transformed. Friends, in the light, we hold up Heidi McLaughlin. Her mom, Eva Maria Bode, passed this week, and we send our love and we hold her in our prayers. We continue to hold Richard Scuderi in the light after a bad fall that has had injuries to his face, but also brought significant medical bills. And he continues to be grateful for our prayers and donations during these days of recovery. And we also lift up Lindsay Nojek once again. She is a public health nurse working in Forsyth County and has been under incredible stress during these pandemic days. I brought back a prayer from Bob Henry, who is the pastor of First Friends in Indianapolis because it fits so well with the message that Phil is offering today. Let us not rush to the language of healing before understanding the fullness of the injury and the depth of the wound. Let us not speak of reconciliation without speaking of building relationships or how we can repair the breach and how we can restore the loss. Let us not value property over people. Let us not protect material objects while human lives hang in the balance. Let us not value a false peace over a righteous justice. Let us not be afraid to sit with the ugliness, the messiness, and the pain that is life in community together. Let us not offer cliches to the grieving, those whose hearts are being torn asunder. Let us mourn black and brown people whose lives and bodies are too often devalued and discarded by a nation whose sins have been too quickly forgotten. Let us lament the loss of lives by those tasked with protecting and serving the communities that they police. Let us weep a criminal justice system which is often neither blind nor just. Let us be people willing to mourn and rend our garments of privilege and ease and sit in the ashes of this nation's original sin. Let us be silent when we don't know what to say. Let us be humble and listen to the pain, rage, and grief pounding from the lips of our neighbors and friends. God, in your mercy, show us our own complicity in injustice. Convict us for our indifference. Forgive us for when we have remained silent. Equip us with a zeal for righteousness. Never let us grow accustomed or acclimated to unrighteousness. God, hear our prayers. Amen.
Good morning, friends from Greensboro Meeting. It's wonderful to be with you. I so regret that the coronavirus derailed our visit this past winter and continues to wreak global havoc, but especially here in the United States. As I record this, we now have 120,000 coronavirus deaths and counting. For a little perspective, that's 8,000 more people than live in High Point, your neighbor to the Southwest. And if that isn't challenging enough, let's not forget that we're grappling with other profoundly difficult issues now. Unmerited violence against people of color perpetrated by those who have taken an oath to serve and protect. Leadership, which cares only for wealth and status and has attracted the worst sort of people, people bent and misshapen by greed and corruption, xenophobia and warped theology. I've made no secret of my distaste and concern for these trends. And last week received an email from someone telling me that since I was a pastor, I should not speak about political matters. But how can anyone with a conscience be silent? If we don't speak, this allows the least morally evolved among us to carry the day. And when they speak, their goal is always to silence, to press their knee of power upon the neck of the powerless until life is gone. Their goal is always to maintain their privilege no matter what. And what of the God they worship? What of the God they venerate and demand we do the same? Isn't it always, invariably, the God who slaughters the firstborn, the God who turns the water to blood, the God who dashes the infants upon the rocks? We can tell a lot about folks by the God they worship, can't we? I have a Jewish friend who is a college professor of Bible and religion and attended our Quaker meeting for a number of years at Fairfield. Because of his unfamiliarity with church life and his naive tendency to trust Quakers, we were able to trick him into teaching adult Sunday school for a year. We asked him to teach the Hebrew scriptures from the perspective of the Jewish faith informed not only by scripture, but by the oral tradition still passed on from one Jewish generation to the next. One Sunday, he spoke of the competing images of God present in the Hebrew scriptures and how those images not only influenced our understanding of God, but also our understanding of what it means to love one another and be in relationship with each other. As an example, he reminded us of the story of Abraham binding his son Isaac to an altar in order to sacrifice him, apparently under the command of God. I'm sure that's a story familiar to all of us. If you're like me, you grew up hearing all these wonderful things about Abraham, but I have to tell you, any man who would do that to a child is criminally insane. I don't care whose voice he thought he heard. According to my Jewish friend, one thread of rabbinical tradition has it that Abraham's wife, Sarah, was so in infuriated with Abraham, she decided not to live with him any longer. She moved to Hebron in the land of Canaan, and he stayed in Beersheba. In that tradition, they died apart 
and estranged. The name Isaac means he laughs because Sarah, who had been childless, was very old when Isaac was born and said people would die laughing when they heard she was pregnant. So she gave birth to laughter and loved her son with all her heart, which explains her separation from Abraham when she heard what he had almost done to their son. Can't you just imagine Abraham telling Isaac on the way home, there's no need to tell your mother about this. We'll just keep it between us. But you know how kids are. Isaac must have told because Sarah packed her bags and got an apartment in Hebron 26 miles away. One more instance in the long and tragic history of men behaving as if women had no say, of power taking no heed of the powerless. Sarah would not stand for it. I like Sarah and think of her often. I think of Sarah every time men start wars and send the children of women to die. I think of Sarah whenever men pass unjust laws and send the children of women to prison. I think of Sarah whenever men are cruel and separate children from their mothers for the crime of seeking a better life elsewhere. I like Sarah. I like that she would no longer live with a man who had been willing to kill their beloved son. I like that she could not pretend everything was okay when everything was clearly not okay. I like that in her old age, with few resources at her disposal, she was able to say, I would rather live alone than with a man who would place our child on an altar and slice him open. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are known as Abrahamic faiths. They are monolithic faiths who worship the God of Abraham. I grew up hearing priests and pastors extol in solemn voices the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as if it were an incantation. Well, let me be clear. I am done with Abraham and his God. I am standing with the God of Sarah. I want nothing to do with a God who would command a father to kill his son in order to test the father's faithfulness. I am done with that God, and I am done with Abraham, who lacked the courage to say to his God what clearly needed to be said. What you ask of me is evil, and I will not do it. So I am done with Abraham, and I am done with Abraham's God. I am standing with the God of Sarah. Now, if Abraham were following the leading of God, then can we also assume Sarah, who the Bible describes as a woman of faith and piety, was also following a divine leading when she packed her bags and left? If so, I am standing with the God who whispered in Sarah's ear, there is a better life for you in Hebron, Pack your bags. It's time to go. I have seen this God in other moments, in other persons. I saw this God in Mary Magdalene, falsely condemned by the historic church as a prostitute, who stood with courage by the dying Jesus long after Peter, James, and John had fled. I am standing with the God of Theodora, the 6th century empress of Byz Byzantium, one of the first rulers to recognize the rights of women who worked tirelessly to prohibit the sex trafficking of young girls. 
I am standing with the God of Elizabeth Fry, the great Quaker reformer, whose work improved the lives of the imprisoned, the sick, and the mentally ill. I am standing with the God of Rosa Parks, who whispered in her ear, keep your seat, you've earned your rest. And today I am standing with the God who is standing with the Central and South American mothers, those who homelands have been torn asunder by our nation's insatiable hunger for drugs, mothers who would rather be separated from their children than see them killed. I am standing with the God who stands with the wives and mothers of black men who have been shot down and beat down by the holders of power. I am standing with those left alone and adrift by this pandemic. I am done with the God of Abraham who cared not a whit for the feelings of a mother. I am standing with the God of Sarah who pointed her to a better life elsewhere. Regrettably, the vestiges of Abraham's God are still with us. That God is worshiped by those who would compel a woman to bear a child she had no say in creating than do nothing to assist her. The Benedictine sister, Joan Chittister, so rightly and boldly said, I do not believe that just because you are opposed to abortion that that makes you pro-life. In fact, I think in many cases, she went on, your morality is deeply lacking. If all you want is a child born, but not a child fed, a child born, but not a child educated, a child born, but not a child housed. The vestiges of Abraham's God are still with us when fathers make war that cost mothers their children. The vestiges of this God are still with us when single women must work two and three jobs and still cannot support their families. The vestiges of Abraham's God are still with us when universal health care is dismissed as socialism, when birth control is limited and denied, when tax dollars are extracted from the poor to enrich the elite. The vestiges of Abraham's God are still with us when the rights of women are struck down, when the perspectives of women and people of color aren't sought, when the powerful do what they wish while the powerless suffer what they must. This is why I urge you to stand with the God of Sarah, who long ago whispered in her ear, there is a better life in Hebron. Let us go there together. Friends, what kind of better life could you and I and our nation travel to right now? What better life could we together create for all people and not just a few? Thank you for letting me join you this Sunday, and I hope circumstances permit for a, a real visit, an in-person visit sometime ahead. Take care.